of it. Um, just got it recording in progress. Um, I have popped in there a little video that um, Alana shared and I have seen that somebody in the Fire Urban, Fire Urban Fundamentals Facebook page has also shared this beautiful little video of a father and his daughter Emily growing up um, with his piano um, playing. So um, it's really very beautiful. So if you haven't seen that somewhere on social media yet, pop into that Google Drive and, um, and find it there because it's really a beautiful example of the 30 year plan in in action for sure but i'm going to launch into some stuff about australian repertoire and resources so um i completely understand if that is not of interest to you and you disappear off the screen but if you want to stick around please do and um now that we're recording we'll be able to share that if you are interested but can't stick around too i'm not going to spend a whole heap of time and um this is certainly not any kind of definitive list, it's just some go-tos for me. Um, and I thought what I'd do is I would start by talking about um, Indigenous Australian content because, and not because I'm an expert in this area or feel particularly comfortable, but because I know that it's something that people are really interested and wanting um, to do better in terms of sharing that, um, that repertoire with their children and their students. And I guess the first thing to talk about in terms of that Indigenous Australian content is that if we are looking at um, traditional music that's been passed down through the oral tradition, which kind of aligns with Firebun's philosophy of using folk music, unfortunately in our in Indigenous cultures, there is very little that has survived. Um, as we know, you know, with um, government policy, most of our um, Indigenous people were pushed onto um, missions and um, where their own culture and their own music was not allowed, was not allowed to be shared. And so for, um, there is very little music that has survived that is um, traditional Indigenous music. There is some that was collected um, from ethnomusicologists kind of in the middle of last century, um, particularly some from the Maranoa region, the Gungari people um, in southern Queensland, and some of you would be familiar with songs like um, Jabin Jabin Kiruka, and there's the Maranoa lullaby. Um, and then there's also some there's um, collections of Torres Strait Islander songs that have been collected by ethnomusicologists um, that some of you, again, would be familiar with or and um, but most of those songs are not going to be songs that are simple songs in the sense of what we use within this eight part workout of the um, first steps. So while they're absolutely um, songs that you can bring into your music program they're not the simplest songs that your little five-year-olds are going to be able to sing um, initially so probably the only one of those um, authentic indigenous songs that i have used as a simple song within that work workout is the maranoa lullaby and i have i don't use that with my first years um, i would wait you know till they're um, at least in their second year of first steps. And that's the Maranoa lullaby, um, which if you aren't familiar with um, is And that is the only simple, simple song that I personally have found that's an authentic Indigenous song. And I'm really um, interested to hear from other people. Um, but I think I'll kind of do a whole bunch of talking and then I'd love to throw it open to others if you found things. Now, post that um, kind of authentic Indigenous um, material, there there is a whole kind of other group of songs. So then there are, there's a whole bunch of songs that were created on these missions. So, um, and Jesse Lloyd has done um, some work in collecting those mission songs and being able to share them. Again, they are not 
the simple songs that little children would be learning as their first songs. Um, but there definitely are those mission songs from, from that period in time. And then there's a whole bunch of work more recently where people are using traditional language either um, in known songs like nursery rhymes, like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, things like that, or they're writing original songs with, um, with um, in language. So for me, I live on Wadawaran country, and so I reached out to our traditional, um, the corporation of our traditional owners here, and, and asked them, you know, is there any authentic Indigenous um, songs that are, that are known and um, still um, in knowledge and they said no there are none but they have recently um, they've recently re um, worked with a young Wadawurrung person who's written some original songs that are mostly in English but incorporate some Wadawurrung words in them again they are not simple songs in the sense of um, first steps in music um, so they you know, and I know that there will be similar resources for you in your own um, parts of Australia, and it take it would it will take some research to reach out to your own um, communities that live locally, but possibly similarly they are not going to necessarily be that simple simple song repertoire. I do know that there are some people who have been using um, simple songs, particularly from um, the. Australian code, I kind of um, repertoire and um, having them translated into language. Um, I'm not sure where I sit with that. I have to say it feels a little uncomfortable for me to be singing a So Me song in language, um, but this is definitely um, a body of work that is changing all the time and more and more people are engaging in different ways. So I think over the next coming years, there will be some real significant shifts and movement in what's available and how we approach that within our within our classroom settings. Um, the other thing I was going to say is I, I recently, um, I recently shared and I'm going to pop it in the chat there. Um, my thoughts around this on um, uh, Little Bluebirds blog. Um, um, so that's just, um, it's a blog that uh, Bluebird Foundation, who I work with, um, has set up for parents and young children. It's not just music, it's also about visual arts and nature play and food and anything early childhood. But I, I specifically write about music on there. Um, so I wrote that uh, last year just kind of to gather some of my thoughts about um, Indigenous music and how we can share that with our littlest people. In there, there's also a bunch of, there are a bunch of links to videos, um, including, you know, some of some of the nicest um, original content that I found with, um, with in language, yeah, some of the ABC ones, that, and um, there's some links in there that you can, that you can have as a starting point and, and kind of keep, keep searching from there. I know that ASME on their chapter pages have, um, and it's slightly different on each um, state's chapter page, but I know the Victorian chapter has a Padlet where there's um, some resources that people have been collecting around um, how they can use Indigenous music in their programs. I know the WA page has a, um, has a, a just, it's a web page with links um, and resources. Um, so that's possibly a good starting point as well um, if you're looking to learn more there. So before I kind of launch into kind of colonial Australian music then, is there anyone who wants to kind of comment or has resources to share in that Indigenous space or just open up a little conversation about that? I just want to okay. know what, oh, sorry. sorry, you go. You go. I just want to know what Little Bluebirds is, that's all. So Little Bluebirds is a blog, um, as I said, it's attached to the um, not-for-profit organisation that I work with, Bluebird Foundation, and it's a way that we share with um, parents of young children, babies, toddlers and preschoolers. We run a whole bunch of programs, including First Steps in, in Music, and it's just one more way that we connect with parents um, and families, um, not just for our parents and families that we're connected with through groups, but anyone can access it, um, obviously, ac across the world. 
And did you have something as well to add, Michelle? Oh, I was just speaking for the WA um, people. There's, oh, it's just going out of my head. It's too early. Um, uh, Majita Warner is a choir, but they haven't got their songs in um, notation, but there's some that are like Ni Ja Nunga Buja Court. Um, but obviously that's um, all Nunga language because we've only sort of still got the Nunga language for WA. Um, and, um, oh, Gina Williams, of course. Is, yes. She's done a lot of stuff. And yeah. her stuff is all in notation as well if you need it. Um, that's been good. Yes, I saw, I saw of, Gina at the ASME conference in, when it was in Perth. And, um, yeah, she yeah, was yes, yes, yes. Yes, I was at the time. Yeah. She was very and good. Then, Deborah Cheatham in Victoria has you know, similar um, with a choir and, and they've written original songs with those children who have been involved in short black opera, opera called the Dangala Songbook. Again, not simple songs for our very beginning singers, um, but if you're, you know, working with older children and have a choir or um, even classroom settings when they're a little older, there are definitely more resources in for that age group. I think I found Mal Mal from a Kodai at w Australia. Okay. Is that Horace Strait, isn't it? I, I'm not familiar with that one. Does anyone um, connect? It's only three notes. Mal, 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 come me go, come me go, Columbus, Columbus. It's like a, a passing game. So you use your ah. stones to. I was using it as a decoding song for Do Re Mi. Yeah, so that's a great example that it is actually that is a simple song the three three notes so that's a really beautiful addition thanks michelle yep that's the only one i know <laughs> yeah that's all right they're, they're very um few and far between anything else before i kind of move on to a colonial australian music now all right so as we know, Australia is, uh, in terms of our colonial sentiment, we're quite a young country. And so, but our roots are in, you know, English and the UK from our kind of convict um, history. And then in, um, and then also European roots, you know, for example, in South Australia, where people were coming from, um, you know, Prussia and Germany to escape religious persecution as free settlers and brought some of the European music with them. So while um, while John's collections of songs have specifically been collected from the United States, many of those, the roots of those songs are similar to the songs that we have um, brought, have been brought here to Australia. And in that Google Drive, I've popped a, a document called Twinkle Twinkle something what's it called <laughs> oh i can't just see it there oh where is it here i've got it open somewhere twinkle twinkle southern cross and robert holden has um you know pulled together um gone back through archives um particularly of um newspapers from early colonial times and found a bunch of resources and looked at how um the song heritage that was brought across to australia then evolved once people were here in this country and there's particularly some nice things in there um, for the infants and toddlers so there's a whole bunch of um uh knee bounces and simple um nursery rhymes where lyrics have been changed so um so for example one little knee bounce that i've used from that collection is based on one that I think John's got in his books, um, I Had a Little Pony, but the, the version in there is, I had a little pony, his name was Dapple Grey. I sent him down to Melbourne to win the cup one day. He couldn't beat Poseidon, for Poseidon's hard to beat, and now he pulls a handsome cab along a Sydney street. So you can see the similar routes to um, all of those songs that John's collected, but they've got this Australian uh, twist on it. Um, another one of my favourites from that collection is um, Johnny and Jane and Jack and Lou Butler stares through Woolamaloo, Woolamaloo and cross the domain round the block and home again. Hey ho, tipsy toe, give us a kiss and away we go. And there's beautiful opportunity if you're bouncing them on your knee to tip them over on hey ho, tipsy toe, give a kiss and away. We go. So if you are if you're working particularly in that with that infant toddler curriculum, 
definitely um, delve into that um, uh, that history and um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of things in there, some of which you you'll look at and go, oh, no, I'm not going to use that, but others that could be just little treasures to um, to incorporate into your program. Let me see. So after that, um, then, you know, a couple of the um, resources that I use, and you're probably familiar with all of these things, is Merrily Merrily is kind of one of my go-tos. So similarly to John in that he went out to, um, you know, older people in his community, Merrily Merrily, if you're not aware, is a resource that was put together by the Nursing Mothers Association of Australia as it was called at the time, now the Australian Breastfeeding Association. But they basically did a call out themselves. So they said, everyone send in your favourite songs for your little people and rhymes and we'll put together this collection. Um, so having said that, not everything in here is a folk song. So there are definitely composed songs in here, some of which have then kind of established themselves you know, in that tradition of just being passed on from generation to generation. Um, but one of the things to definitely note about Merrily Merrily is that the keys that they've chosen to notate them in, uh, they've chosen because they're simple to play on guitar. So they're not necessarily the keys that you would use um, with um, in your classes, often they are much lower than you would want to use um, if you're, you know, following John's um, kind of guide of those keys of F and G that keep keep um, us up in our head voices. Um, but you know, some examples in there of things that aren't necessarily um, folk songs that are they have been composed, but have kind of worked their way into our our um, oral tradition of things like like a leaf or feather in the windy windy weather and then another one um chug 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 i'm a little tug i pull the big boats chug 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 um so that's definitely a resource that i dip into and then following from that and probably one of the reasons why some of this composed repertoire has almost become uh, our folk um, song is because of um, play school. So, and John, I don't know if you're listening in there, but um, in Australia, we have a, a TV show called Play School that's been running for, did it just celebrate 50 years? Something like that. It's been running for decades and decades. And it actually, um, it actually really aligns quite beautifully with John's philosophy of um, intimate music making with people and um, while it <laughs> thanks <laughs> thanks Michelle's husband um, and while it is delivered through the screen um, as John talked about it um, invites participation from the children so it asks them to do those things um, in their own home um, again one of the things about play school not just in terms of the notation um, in their um, published books but also in terms of what they present on the screen is that again they are often in keys that are far too low for little people to sing um, the presenters are generally actors famous people for whatever reason and they um, sing in keys that they're comfortable in so while much of the repertoire and the mode of delivery is um, beautiful the keys are often not so just be aware of that if you are um, using things from that kind of play school um, era and again some of the things from play school that um, i would say have almost become kind of australian folk songs are things like rolling all around in a boat on the sea roll 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 along with me a beautiful one with a little one on your lap rolling them around and then you bounce when the, the waves get bigger things like that so if you um if you haven't had little people in your own life and had the joy of watching play school um uh it's definitely developed a shared repertoire for generations now, um, although that is becoming less and less because now that um, we don't rely on free to air TV that everyone watch, has to watch at the same time, everyone streams whatever they want, 
I, um, even that shared play school kind of repertoire is being lost too. Um, another one that, again, probably most of you are already familiar with is Catch a Song. Um, so kind of one of those um, Australian Kodai um, Bibles in a way. Again, when you flick through that, you'll notice that most of them are not necessarily Australian folk songs. There's um, all sorts of things in there, English, there's American, there's um, German, there's all sorts of things in there. But probably one that does have some of those very simple beginning songs in it. So worth um, having a little delve into there. Um, then, I have also popped into the Google Drive a little pitch exploration poem. So um, kind of thinking through those steps that my a colleague and I wrote um, a couple of years ago, almost kind of based on that Cowboy Joe um, uh, format, but with an Australian as the response. Um, I went out hiking in the bush on a fine and sunny day. My mother went ahead of me and called to show the way. And you would all reply, Goo um, so you can have a look in there. It was it was in the Fame newsletter, um, I think last year, um, with a video of me doing it with a child model. Um, so feel free to kind of grab that one and use it. Um, and then probably one of the areas that is um, easier to find um, Australian content for is the song tail part of the um, workout. And obviously we haven't got to that yet with um, John in our training, but probably most many of you are familiar with um, his concept of a song tail um, generally at the very end of a class where you as adult sings a song artfully for the children um, as the audience. And there is a whole bunch of Australian bush ballads that you can draw on there for um, song tales. Um, you know, a couple of the books that I have, um, like I've got, that's Mike Jackson's Campfire Song book. That's like a, some, you know, these are really old books, but um, they have all sorts of um, bush ballads in them. Botany Bay, Bound for South Australia, Click Go the Shears, The Drover's Dream. There's a whole bunch of bush ballads that you would not expect these beginning little musicians to be singing themselves, but really lend themselves to artful storytelling. Um, one of the things I would note about that, though, is that they take they may take some explanation and um, to give them an actual understanding of what these songs are about. Um, you know, even something like Waltzing Matilda, which I definitely do with my littlest people, um, like my three and four year olds in our preschool classes, because it, it is one of those songs that most Australians will encounter. Um, I really take some time to ensure that they understand what the story is. and. In fact, many of the adults often say to me, oh, I didn't actually realise that's what happens at the end of Walsing Matilda, which, you know, that surprises me. But um, yeah, often people just kind of let the lyrics wash over them and don't actually engage with the story. So I have a beautiful set that I have um, for Walsing Matilda. And I'm not sure if you can be able to see this. I'm gonna actually put it down on the floor and see if we can. I can set it up so you can see. Let's have a look here. So I have this beautiful felt set. I think you can see there. So I kind of get this out, Where, which way am I going? And I say, uh, um, in today's story, we have a billabong. Here's the water and a coolabar tree. Oh, and look, here's a campfire with a billy full of water. Ah, my story starts with a swag man. I know he's a swag man because look, he's carrying his bed on his back. Here he is sitting on a log by the campfire. Once a jolly swag man camped by a billabong under the shade of a coolabar tree. And he sang as he watched and waited till his billy boiled. You come a waltzing Matilda with me, waltzing Matilda. Sing through the chorus and, and then, oh, can you hear someone coming? 
<gasps> it's a sheep or a jumbuck. Down came a jumbuck to drink at the billabong. Up jumped the swagman and grabbed him with glee. And he sang as he shoved that jumbuck in his tucker bag. Because he wants to eat him later. <laughs> You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me. Waltzing Matilda, sing through the chorus. And then, oh, look, here comes the farmer. He's noticed that a sheep is missing. <gasps> He's riding on his thoroughbred. Down came the squatter, mounted on his thoroughbred. That's a horse. Down came the troopers. One, two, three. They're a bit like policemen. <gasps> and they are cross. Who's that jolly jumbuck you've got in your tucker bag? You come a waltzing Matilda with me. Waltzing Matilda, etc. And then up jumped the swagman, because he didn't want to get caught, and sprang into the billabong. You never catch me alive, said he. And his ghost may be heard as you pass by that billabong. You come a waltzing Matilda with me. Waltzing Matilda. Etc. Etc. So you get the idea that you really, have, <laughs> you really have to explain all those words and concepts, and you don't have to sit and talk about it for a whole bunch of time, but you need to make sense of it for them, so that the story comes alive. It's not just enough to sing it um, when there's words and concepts that they may not immediately um, be familiar with. So that's. Um, that's song tales. Uh, then the other part of song tales is there are a whole bunch of um, books um, where people have, um, oh, um, I found that beautiful set in a wool shop in McLaren Vale in South Australia. <laughs> so I don't know who the beautiful maker was and it was not cheap, but it was, it's just beautiful and it has lasted me for years and years. Um, the other, um, uh, there's a whole bunch of songs where people have um, blue jay songs. So they're songs, they're um, books that have taken familiar songs and rewritten them with an Australian um, flair. So this one is Little Barry Bilby. Little Barry Bilby had a fly upon his nose. Little Peter Possum had a mozzie on his ear. Little Collie Cocky had a beetle on his beak. And the busy buzzy bush bugs won't go away. So that's kind of one example. Um, there's Hush Little Possum. Um, let's have a look. Hush, little possum, don't you cry. Mama will keep you safe and dry. And if the sky rumbles like a train, Mama will shelter you from the rain, etc., etc. So they're ones that I would always introduce the original song first, but you might come back and revisit it and say, oh, and look what I found. Um, there's Christmas versions of things, deck the, um, deck the shed with bits of wattle and Aussie jingle bells, lots of blue jay songs, but um, that do give a beautiful Australian flavour um, to things. And I'm sure you all have a whole bunch of recommendations in that kind of space too. Then what I was going to just briefly mention, and um, John may talk about this um, in the coming um, uh, lectures, or he may have even, or even or already mentioned, I can't, I can't remember, but um, this idea of the family folk song project, and I would really encourage you to do this with your families that you are working with. As um, we've mentioned, someone we brought up in the chat, I can't remember who it was now, um, talking about their um, students, many of them who have English as a second language. Elizabeth was um, talking about that. Here in Geelong, we have, um, we have a really, 
um, broad mix of refugee and new arrival fam families. So we have a whole range of um, cultures in certain parts of our city, certainly not throughout, like many um, cities, we have different kind of geographical areas. Um, and one of the things that I would really encourage you to do is to yeah, look at the little people in front of you, find out what their cultural roots are. And, in, and if you don't have access or know about what the, their musical traditions are to ask their families. So this is something that we did um, actually with our choir program, the North Children's Choir, um, a couple of years ago during COVID. Um, and we collected um, songs from all of the families and um, we learnt them as a choir and shared those with each other. And, you know, really beautiful things. So we've, you know, had a lullaby um, from the Karen culture. Um, we've got, we, we collected a Punjabi lullaby. We had um, an Italian little spinning song. We had, um, what else have we got? Um, from the Philippines in Tagalog, a little song about a hut. Um, and they you know, it's just such a rich source of material and the children are so proud to share something from their family culture. The parents are delighted to be that you are interested and it gives everyone this sense of um, how important it is to recognise that, um, you know, we have all these similarities, but we can also celebrate our unique differences and what we bring into the music classroom. So um, this little resource is um, was put together by Kathy Ward um, and where she did a family folk song project in her school. And it kind of steps you through how she did it, um, how she sent out letters and um, collected the songs. And then it does include um, a whole bunch of the songs that were collected in her community. Um, as I said, we did ours during COVID, so we actually used Google Classroom and people made videos at home and sent them, submitted them, and it was just such a rich um, and beautiful thing to do. The final piece before I throw it open to you all to share um, your um, ideas and resources is just in terms of the folk dance piece. So again, so this isn't specific to um, first steps children, but if you are doing this with older children, I just thought it was worth mentioning because we've been doing the folk dancing um, with John at the beginning of our sessions. And if you are working with older children in your school, that of course the dances that um, John is sharing again, our dance tradition does have the same roots um, in that, you know, that, that English tradition has come across on the ships. One of the things that John has noted when he has been in Australia and seen us as Australians doing the dances that he teaches is that as Aussies, we have a more um, robust, raucous approach to dancing. <laughs> So he was all, oh, he always tries to, these are walking dances. Imagine you're in those, um, you know, the period costumes and, and walking carefully and sedately. Whereas our Aussie dance tradition kind of became more of that bush dance tradition where we're in our jeans and our flannel shirts and we we skip and we um yeehaw a bit more um so a couple of resources and one that you're probably very familiar with is the bushwhackers so they've been around you know since i was a kid at school from the 80s you've probably all danced to their version of the heel and toe polka um but they have a great little resource this is the new edition um and they've got how many dancers in there? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine dancers in there, like the heel and toe polka, the Queensland backstep, the drongo, strip the willow, the barn dance, the waves of Bondi, the stockyards, under the bridge and the park, pride of Erin. So many of them um, will be very familiar and at, to those um, New England dance master um, dancers because Again, we share the same roots, um, but they've um, evolved a little. Um, so that's that one. And then this next resource, I have to admit, I have not used. I ordered it at the start of 2020 um, when we were embarking on a project where we were going to be doing um, dancing um, with a group of families. Didn't eventuate in Victoria but, um, uh, during 2020, and I just haven't revisited it, but it's called Captain Cook's Country Dances. And I don't 
um, some of you may be familiar, but there's a group, um, I believe, in WA. Michelle might have more knowledge on this because I know she's from WA. And they have collected these um, these dances and songs um, from um, from historical notes and things, particularly from the ship voyages that came out. There is a group who um, from time to time get together and dance these dances in period dress. Um, and uh, I think you can, you can follow them on Facebook and things. As I said, I have I can't personally, um, I haven't personally used the dances in there. They are more complicated than the bushwhackers. So probably more a um, an adult um, or high school um, kind of level, um, but I just thought interesting to throw into the mix as well. Don't know if anyone's familiar with that. Whew. So I think that's my belt through my kind of go-tos, but I would love to open it up to you all and hear um, yeah, other suggestions of where you find repertoire or just comments or anything you'd like to share. I loved all of those, thank you. Um, shenanigans is another CD I used. Absolutely for dance, yep. Um, I didn't bring up my, I left all my things at school, so maybe I'll bring it next week. Sorry, I was just looking forward to yours, but that was, that was great. The one you just showed us, um, can you give me some details about where that is to be purchased? I'll see if I can find it again. Yes, definitely. I ordered it online. So, I'll, oh, Philip's dog. I think if you search for Philip's dog, let me just see if I can find it while we're talking. Um, someone else can jump in with um, anything that they want to um, share. I'll see if I can find it and pop it in the chat. I just wanted to say um, the Music Make Magic shop is a great resource in terms of the song tales. Yes. They have oodles and oodles. And um, if you haven't or kind of um, noticed that um, there's, you can, you've got a 10% um, discount at the moment if you're doing this course. So if you spend over $200, you can get a discount. So it's a good chance if you have been eyeing off or want to go and check it out. Um, yeah, they have so many song tale books in there. I just found that link to the Captain Cooks there. Oh, Sarah, it's in the email that John sends out. Um, each week when he sent has sent out the email, I'm just pulling it up but I so I can find it. Here it is. Um, there's a little blurb there. In, if you go back to the one that we got a couple of days ago, there's a little blurb there in the link to Music Works Magic, but he, that's I'll dump the code in the chat as well. That's um, the code for you. Um, I didn't mean to like interrupt on the discount code and all of that, but um, the We Sing Silly Song is something that um, is used in the music class that my daughter and I take, and we were using it actually it, the book that I have at my house is, was used with me as a child. Um, so it's a, been around for a long time, but it's just a great collection of simple songs that are easily learned. And uh, I know that's more of the, the, the United States perspective. We're supposed to be talking about Australian influences, but um, yeah, still a lot of them are just really, really good classic. I don't know. Anyway, throwing that yeah. in there. And they've got like a website that goes along with it. So like you can hear the songs and teach yourself because sometimes I'm sitting here looking at the books and I'm like, I can kind of guess the rhythm, but then unfortunately I'm not always as good at like hearing the, like how it should be sung. So I'm sitting there plunking it on a piano to try to figure it out. Um, but these have play it for you. Beautiful. And the other thing I'll, I'll say about that is that, um, you know, John talks about, you know, when you are bringing repertoire into the classroom, that like, like Kodai's philosophy, that we should start with our own, our own music, the music of our own people, and then we should learn the music of our nearest neighbours. And so for us in Australia, like, Geographically, that is, you know, um, New Zealand, New Guinea, um, those island cultures. But for our little people, 
actually the cultures that are closest to the to them are the ones they see on the screen and for them much of the content they see is american so i you know i think that that is a little different for us now because our world is so interconnected um that yeah our nearest neighbors can look different they're not just necessarily our nearest geographical neighbors they're the neighbors that we connect with the most through our popular culture perhaps i don't know if that's i don't know how other people feel about that but it's certainly something that i have um thought about for the little people that i see anything else that people want to open up or um comment on and perhaps if you go away and you and you go oh yeah no i use this resource or this is great source and um things perhaps we can put together a shared doc that we could um you know share some of those thoughts and ideas um, conveniently, I've actually already prepared something. <laughs> I created a spreadsheet ages ago, which I've shared on Facebook, but didn't get many bites on. So I'll post the link to that in the chat if people want to contribute to that. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe, um, maybe it's worth, um, Sarah, are you in the Fame Australia Facebook group as well? Yeah, maybe it's worth sharing it in there. And, um, you know, if there are a few more people who are really kind of actively engaging with the training right now that might um, get a bit more traction. Thank you. Um, yeah, those um, shared resources are so valuable. All right, well, unless there's anything else, I'm conscious that, you know, we've, we've, gone, we've run very late now. Um, uh, yeah, we've got this recording for those who um, weren't able to stay and did want to hear um, the discussion. But thank you so much for those of you who did stick around um, and um, yeah, come back with more questions and resources and ideas next week. Thank you thank all. You, Anything from you, John? No, no, that was wonderful. Thank you. Amazing. See you all next week.